gore. The gore the merrier, or so it seemed during the 70s and 80s. And throughout many a decade, gorehounds love all the red splatter a screen can handle. And one of the best to give the gore, all the more, is Tom Savini. A master of splatter, an icon of special effects, and a director and actor too, Savini has been the inspiration for more filmmakers and effects artists than I can count, and continues to do so. He's also never stopped making monsters and mayhem either. Tom Savini is one of the modern horror legends, and I think it's time to take a look at what made this master the macabre and mustache into the icon he is today. So get ready, because it's going to become a bit bloody as we find out what the f*** happened to Tom Savini. Tom Savini was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on November 3, 1946. The same year as Claude Rains' Phantom of the Opera and She-Wolf of London would be released in theaters. Savini grew up finding a quick love of Hollywood magic thanks to movies and, in particular, the story of monster legend Lon Chaney Sr. and the film about Chaney's life, Man of a Thousand Faces. Like many of today's young and dream-filled special effects artists, Tom started doing his own makeups on himself, family, and friends at a very young age. During his adolescence and continuing through college, Savini kept his love of makeup alive and would eventually also want to act in school productions. It was during his time in college that Savini would, as many other young men at the time, head to Vietnam. His time in Vietnam would show Savini the very real horror of war. Savini was a combat photographer who would record on film the slaughter and death of the battlefield. This would follow him into the creations he would later make for film audiences, and why something Savini creates is typically far more unnerving and visceral than the usual horror movie fare. Having been asked about how the experience in the war and seeing the actual carnage in person would affect his work, Savini has said, I did see a lot of first-hand anatomically correct gore, and I think the most important part of what that was is if we create a dead body or situation, there's a certain feeling you get from seeing the real thing. If I'm creating a gory effect and I don't get the same feeling when I saw the real stuff, I'm not satisfied. I hated that when I watched a war movie and someone dies, some people die with one eye open and one eye half closed. Sometimes people die with smiles on their faces because the jaw is always slack. I incorporated the feeling of the stuff I saw in Vietnam into my work. When Savini got back from the war, he would go into Carnegie Mellon University, where he'd focus on learning more about production, film, and acting. In 1974, Savini would work on his first big screen horror feature, which would actually tackle the Vietnam War and the effects it would have on soldiers with the Bob Clark produced and directed Death Dream. Yes. The same Bob Clark who would do Black Christmas, as well as A Christmas Story. The film focus is on a family who receives the news that their son was killed in the war. Magically, the son named Andy returns home, apparently alive. It's not long though that it's obvious something isn't right with Andy. Death Dream's story of the young soldier returned home, but not quite alive, is an unnerving film with a nightmare look into a family and small town warped by death and war. You can also find it under the title Dead of Night. It would be the connection to Pittsburgh, though, that would lead Savini to one of the most important partnerships of his career. 1978 would begin Savini's career in pairing with George Romero on the creepy and haunting Martin. The vampire film would combine black and white footage for flashbacks and a current day setting which would find Romero's soon-to-be wife Christine playing opposite Savini as her boyfriend, with John Amplis playing the title vampire. Romero himself would appear on screen as a priest. Savini would create a wrist-cutting effect for the film. That same year, Romero and Savini would team up again for another horror classic, Dawn of the Dead. This time, Savini would portray a biker named Blades on screen, who comes to a bad end. Well, maybe not an end, as we'll see in a while, as well as doing a number of gory effects for the zombies and their victims. Dawn of the Dead is still considered one of the best zombie films ever made, and it is in no small part to the gruesome realism of the special effects and the smart commentary that the movie brings to the screen, all under the sticky red gore splashing over everything. His work on the film would be nominated for a Saturn Award for Best Makeup Effects. 1980 would see Savini firmly cement himself in the annals of horror's goriest stories with two entries into the genre. The first, Savini would actually have a rather short but effective role in, William Lustig's cult and grindhouse classic Maniac was, as the title promises, insane, and so was the production, which managed to film the movie without permission on the streets of New York. The film is notorious for its extremes of violence and gore, thanks to Savini. Maniac follows the tormented and tormenting Frank Zito, as played by Joe Spinell, who was also responsible for the story. 
Frank was abused horribly by his mother growing up as she worked her job as a prostitute. Due to this, Frank has become the maniac of the title, murdering women and keeping their scalps on the various mannequins that litter his apartment. The reason Savini's actually in front of the camera for this one was he already had a mold of his head made already, so it was cheaper to blow up his own head instead. The scene, which to this day is still wowza, actually was filmed with live ammo. Savini's fake head as Disco Boy was filled with leftover food stuff and fake blood, and that's just as gnarly as you can imagine. Also, the live ammo thing was just as risky as you can imagine, and the crew hightailed it out of the location as soon as the scene was done. Maniac was a nasty, down and dirty film, which has since become a classic in the hearts and minds of horror fans around the world. This would include Elijah Wood, who would star in a remake of Maniac in 2012, and which would also be produced by William Lustig. You should check out both of these if you haven't already. In May of that same year, a legend was born thanks to Savini and Sean Cunningham with the release of Friday the 13th. The story of Camp Blood and the various and sundry murders of the counselors there kept Savini busy creating horror upon horror. The iconic ending of the film and Jason appearing out of the lake after what should have been a happy ending was actually Savini's idea. He was inspired by Carrie's surprise hand grab from the grave and thought having Jason actually appear would be a great finale. The film would be shot on a budget of $550,000. It would wind up making nearly $60 million. That is a lot of profit. It would be no surprise that the studio would want a sequel to it, but Savini declined to work on the second Friday because in his mind, Mrs. Voorhees was dead and Jason wasn't actually around, let alone how he could have been grown up and walking about. Instead, he'd go to work on another summer camp slasher called The Burning. Savini would create more horrific murder scenes as well as the creepy burn killer. No, not that one. Cropsey would predate Freddy Krueger by about a few years. Savini based Cropsey off of real burn victims and his own personal memories of a homeless man he'd seen growing up. The film wasn't a hit when it was released, but has since gone on to be considered a fan favorite. 1981 would see Savini's work in another slasher film that has over the years become more appreciated and beloved by horror fans. Sadly, when it was released, The Prowler didn't even break even, but Savini states his work in this film is some of his best and a favorite. In the roulette wheel of chosen weapon by an 80 slasher, The Prowler seems to have chosen the pitchfork. The film starts in 1945 and then moves to 1980 at a celebration for college students and others who fall prey to the aforementioned Prowler. That same year, Savini would appear on screen as the Black Knight Morgan in George Romero's Knight Riders. The film is an interesting retelling of the King Arthur legend, with modern knights jousting on motorcycles. The poster is as epic as you can imagine, with Ed Harris on a badass bike, in armor, and holding a mace and a shield. Honestly, I can see where this movie probably more than a little inspired Sons of Anarchy, especially the ending. In 1982, Savini and Romero would join forces again for one of the greatest anthology horror films ever made, Creepshow. The movie would be a massive love letter to all things EC Comics and would showcase Savini's fantastic special effects, and it was all written by the king of horror himself, Stephen King. How could this not be amazing? Tom Savini would work on more projects over the early 80s, including Alone in the Dark and a return to Friday the 13th for the final chapter just to kill off Jason. The joke was on Tom here, obviously. In 1984, Savini would do double duty in the first of three episodes of Tales from the Dark Side, one of the best anthology horror series of all time, directing Inside the Closet. The episode would feature Lizzie, one of the sources of my nightmares growing up. Lizzie was a child, we can guess? A child what, I have no idea, but her father loved her. Savini created Lizzie and, as said, would go on to direct two more episodes of the classic series over its run. But Inside the Closet will forever be a standout for me and fans of the show. 1985 would be a big year for Savini when it came to the undead. He'd appear in the low-budget horror film The Ripper as demonic Jack the Ripper. Just a personal note here, I actually saw this when I was 10 years old and remember freaking out my family who thought this was appropriate for a 10-year-old girl to see when I said, oh, he's pretty. I still stick to my observation. Tom Savini was quite pretty as Jack the Ripper and I can almost guarantee you Brian Fuller would agree with me. But moving on. The same year Savini would bring the Ripper to life, he'd also be busy bringing a lot of the dead back to a sort of life in Romero's third entry of the dead films, Day of the Dead. 
They would showcase every bit of Savini's prowess with Bub the Nearly Human Zombie, various stages of decomposition, gore, and the infamous tearing apart of roads, which entailed actual entrails that had gone bad over the weekend in a broken fridge. The film would win the Saturn Award for Best Makeup Effects that year. Eventually, Savini's work in special effects would lead him to become a friend and colleague of Dick Smith, one of the legends of special effects, and who, like Savini, would create monster makeup guidebooks for beginners and students of the art to learn with. In 1986, Savini would bring Leatherface back to life with Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2, following that sequel up by working on the sequel to Creep Show, which he would also star in as The Creep. He'd also co-star as a teacher opposite Bobcat Goldthwait in the awesome music video, Be Cruel to Your School by Twisted Sister, with Savini turning into Alice Cooper and Bobcat becoming Dee Snyder. Savini would provide the zombie effects as well. In 1988, Savini would join George Romero for Monkey Shines, creating a number of monkey puppets and animatronics. During the decade, Savini would also appear three times on Late Night with David Letterman, each one of them more hilarious than the last. In 1990, Savini would again work with Romero as well as Italian horror master Dario Argento for the Double the Scare, Two Evil Eyes, based on the works of Edgar Allan Poe. That same year, Savini would step behind the camera as a director for the remake of Romero's classic, Night of the Living Dead. The film meant a lot to Savini, who hadn't been around to work on the original, and had been asked by Romero personally to not only do the special effects this go-round, but to direct. Sadly, the production was an easy one, with a lot of interference from producers and issues with keeping the film to an R rating. While the film wasn't welcomed when first released, it has since become loved by fans due to the work of Savini and some prints which have made the rounds, thanks to Savini screening them, which show more of what he had envisioned for the project. Savini would work on multiple projects through the 90s, including directed video films like H.P. Lovecraft's Necronomicon and cult classics like Killing Zoe. In 1996, Savini would create a legend of his own with his role in Robert Rodriguez's vampire classic, From Dusk Till Dawn. Sex Machine was as notorious as his codpiece. His intro scene also included Greg Nicotero as the lowlife he whips the beer from. In 2000, Savini started what is perhaps one of the just most freaking cool college courses in history with the Tom Savini Special Makeup Effects Program, part of the Douglas Education Center in Pennsylvania. Savini himself designed the curriculum and has had graduates go to onto careers at Universal Studios, KB Effects, and more. The program is still very successful and continues to produce amazing talents. Savini would continue working through the 2000s in both effects and acting, appearing in Romero's 2005 release, Land of the Dead, as his now zombified biker blades. Told you he'd show up again. Continuing his work with Robert Rodriguez, Savini would appear as the very unlucky deputy Tolo in Planet Terra, Rodriguez's segment of Grindhouse. He'd also appear in Rodriguez's over-the-top action flick, Machete, as the fantastically named Osiris Amanpour, who would also show up again in Machete Kills. In 2016, he'd return to the From Dust Till Dawn universe in Rodriguez's From Dust Till Dawn series. In 2017, Savini would enter a new arena with the Friday the 13th video game, designing a special Savini Jason skin. The exclusive skin was designed to represent the way Jason would have appeared if he had escaped hell after the events of the final Friday, Devil's Pitchfork and all. 2019 would see Tom Savini return to the Creepshow world as well as the director's chair with the Creepshow Anthology series episode by the silver water of Lake Champlain. That same year, he'd bring horror to a whole new level in the WWE as he created the amazingly creepy and effective mask for Bray Wyatt's The Fiend along with his effects team, even going so far as to design a rather disturbing championship belt featuring the creepy character. In the following year, Savini would appear in two more series, Nosferatu, the series based off the Joe Hill novel as Old Snake. He'd also appear as the locksmith in Lock and Key, a series where a group of the teen characters is actually known as the Savini Squad. In 2022, Savini would return to the video game world for Evil Dead The Game and the awesome Savini Ash skin. The story behind this exclusive, which looks very gothic and crow inspired, was that this ash landed in an alternative timeline where the evil within the Necronomicon began. It corrupts Ash's mind as well as his body, hence the very dark look for the character. Speaking of dark, 
It would be that same year that Savini's handiwork would arrive back on the big screen in a big way with one of the year's best horror films, The Black Phone. As previously seen with Nosferatu, this project would be from the mind of Joe Hill. Savini would be designing the iconic masks of the film's bad guy, The Grabber, and his work is as horrifyingly beautiful as ever. Tom Savini has never stopped working, and he's never stopped appreciating and being there for his fans. He's appeared at numerous horror conventions over the years, and always brings some amazing props with him. Usually fluffy, which is his favorite. Just don't get too close. Tom Savini is one of the modern masters of makeup and the macabre. While his work does include a lot of gore, it's a disservice to him to just say that's what he does. Savini is an artist and a master who followed his dreams and the nightmares of his youth after seeing what could be thanks to guys like Lon Chaney and Jack Pierce. He's a sculptor, a painter, and more than a little bit of a magician. He's brought to life monsters, nightmares, and dreams. He's created the real and the unreal in an equal measure. And he, just like his idol Dick Smith, shared the secrets and took the time to teach kids who wanted to know how to do it too. In 2015, a fantastic documentary was released under the very appropriate title, Smoke and Mirrors, The Story of Tom Savini, and I strongly suggest it if you want to know even more of the man, the myth, and the legend. At the age of 76, Tom Savini is still going strong, going to conventions, and still working at the dream factory of Hollyweird. And more power to him. Thanks for the nightmares, Tom. Keep them coming. <laughs>